thanks as well to uh, Beatrice and Angela for organizing this. Um, it, it's something that uh, if it was ever taken for granted, it certainly doesn't seem these days. I think this is one of the first poetry events I attended, uh, much less been a part of in, in some years. So um, I'm really grateful. Um, so I first uh, got to know Bob and his poetry 25 years ago or so. Um, and uh, that's been one of the great pleasures um, of my life is to know Bob and Juno. And I've learned, uh, I've never learned more from anyone than I have from them. Um, and uh, I think that one of the things that was distinctive when I first got to know Bob's work was um, that this, he was a great poet of ambivalence, among other things. Um, uh, I think that the tensions in his work, you could really see he was, the time I first encountered it, he was coming off a, a great um, run of books, um, The Clean Dark, Waving to Heart Crane, and um, then just as I got to, I think shortly after I first started corresponding with him, Black Water came out. And you can even hear in those titles um, both the sense of place, his engagement with the river, um, but also the, the sort of darkness that pulls them. Um, if you don't know, Hart Crane drowns, so waving to Hart Crane has, has at least a, um, a, a bitter uh, ambivalence to it as well. Um, so one of the things that has really surprised me um, as his work has developed is to find him also, um, after moving through um, ambivalence and darkness and writing, as you heard in the poems, to uh, Brett Whiteley and his daughter, he became a great poet of elegy. Um, and then I think he's become, um, to my surprise, a great poet of happiness. Um, and I found that so interesting. I remember um, a poet named Bill Berkson saying, for every 10 good um, mournful poems or dark poems, there's one good happy poem, and it's very hard to do that well. Um, and I'm thinking of poems like the garden poem that you read. So I wonder if you could say something about how you approach a poem of happiness or, or, or how you come to that. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, well, for a long time, I, well, I, I had some sorrow in my early years, and, uh, and I had a lot of guilt. Um, but then, as I wrote, I was writing that away, and uh, then I got on to uh, the Eurydice and Orpheus myth, and, uh, and uh, I was imagining Eurydice um, going to, to hell and then uh, trying to get away, and uh, Orpheus conning the, or charming the king of hell, saying, um, let it, let it, let us go, and then okay, as long as you don't look back. And I was thinking, I was like, that's got so much in it that me. But I was thinking, thinking of the don't look back, and then there's a Dylan film called Don't Look Back, and, and I was looking back. That's all I was doing. I was just looking back all the time. By this stage, I met Juno, and uh, Juno started. She told me one of the first things she said to me is a photograph is just a, a, a it's an, it's an art form where you draw with light. And uh, then I kept thinking of coming up from hell, up from Hades, and seeing the sunlight, and how ter terrible it would be for Eurydice to be thrown back down into hell, and Orpheus then going into the sunlight, and then having, it, having to pay the consequences, um, being torn apart by, by women, and, th and his head thrown into the river, um, decapitated and still singing. And I kept thinking of this image, uh, uh, reaching light. What would happen if, if we both reached light? And uh, of course, it wasn't hard to write joyful poems about Juno, because you know, we just get on so well and we're in love, so. Uh, <laughs> um, she wanted me to, she said it was, she wanted me to just say this, this, this little thing about Brett. When, when he was painting a lot of these paintings, I used to be reading him, Arthur Rambo, and, uh, in translation. And one day he asked me for a lend of one of my bird books. I've got all these bird books. I gave him this really beautiful, my best bird book. 
and he was painting and I came back a few days later and he cut all the birds out of the bird book and stuck them onto the painting. <laughs> Oh, I, I kind of was, that's ambivalence because of this beautiful painting absolutely, with my bird book in shreds. <laughs> and then um, about a month later, he uh, turned up and gave me, I was living in Mossman, he turned up and gave me a first edition of John Gould's Birds of Australia. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was that story. That's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think, um, I think it was, uh, Wright Morris, who said that writing is, is real losses and imaginary gains. Yeah. Um, which, when I first heard that, it sounded like a bad bargain. Like, <laughs> who wants to trade real things for imaginary ones? But I think that's the bargain we get. And, yeah, it is. And I think, I mean, your sense of the Orpheus myth is fascinating because there is that double bind that if, if Orpheus looks back, he loses what he's, what he's looking back for. And so there's this this problem of, of memory or retrospection, um, but but as you say, you worked your way around the, or you worked your way through it, I suppose. With yeah. the myth. Um, I I sort of mark that there were earlier poems that do that, but it it felt yeah. like the poems in Net Needle yeah. were partially a breakthrough to that, where you are um, looking back at your childhood with a kind yeah. of um, a fondness um, that was new. Yeah, that was after I'd met. Um, Brasher Ettinger, who's a, a, a painter, philosopher, and psycho psychologist. She's an Israeli, um, she's very famous in Israel and America. Oh, you've heard of She came to our place on the river and she's looking out the window saying, oh, the bush, the wildness. And then she came into my room and she said, this is better, like it was all books and civilization. And, she, and she'd, read, she'd read one of my books before she came up and she said, look, you must write about Eurydice because in all these years, thousands of years, she's never said a thing. No, no poet ever writes about what she says. It's always Orpheus. So if you can write some poems in Eurydice's voice and what she thought about the situation, you'll, you'll do well. And I found that so hard, but I eventually got around it by all those devices. Great. Great. Um, yeah, I did. I, for reaching light, um, after I was done, I do this just out of my own curiosity. I put it through a word count um, to see what the most common words oh, wow. were. Wow. Uh, and, <laughs> and it's interesting, in keeping with this conversation, light occurs 75 times in the book, uh, oh. river 72, wow. night occurs 64, black occurs 55, Amazing. and then tide, dark, day, head. <laughs> wow, that's so these are all, and those are all seems like, seem like these counters in your poetry that circulate. Um, yeah. And I think you share that with Yeats, that they're very simple words and images that, that circulate through your work, but take on meaning as they go. Um, and you often have a, a rich vocabulary, but you also come back to these simple yeah. words too. I've learned that when I, when I was in my late 20s and early 30s, I used all these exotic words and I'd use the sources and dictionaries and trying to find other poets. That's why I like Zukovsky and finding all these really weird words. But then I stopped doing that after really uh, studying Yeats and, and Merwin. They don't use these complex words and I, they were, they were, I was teaching at the WEA at the Adult Educational uh, Association and they, Yeats was the easiest to teach and the most people got it. They got what he, he was actually saying important things. Even, even um, in terms of confessional poetry, he was saying, I, 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 I should be going to war, war, but I'd really like to be with that girl over there in the corner. <laughs> but in a poem that, that didn't offend or wasn't off, it worked, you know, it really worked. And they were simple words. So. I'm more and more trying not to use any difficult word. And Seamus Heaney was another one uh, who, who I uh, saw that in. Well, the, maybe the last question I'll ask is, um, I mean, you've had several selecteds in this, um, sometimes Newman selected, which is a different proposition <laughs> in some ways, because I'm sure your focus would be on that new work. Um, but, Looking back at it from this perspective, were there things that struck you differently or that um, 
that emerged that you, you hadn't expected or that you caused you to think about your own work in different, in different terms? Yeah, well, well uh, my first selective was done by Michael Wilde. Dorothy Hewitt said, oh, that's a Marxist sort of selection. And then the second one was, I think it was Chris Edwards, and that's a lot of the language poetry bias. And then I did one which was kind of mixed up. I, I, uh, I put it in terms of themes rather than chronological order. And it didn't really work so well. Uh, I, I don't know why, but then when you did this new one in chronological order and choosing just the best poems in each book, it, it worked. It, it, I, I, I was surprised I wrote it. It, it kind of really, it was of The others were kind of bits and pieces and half done and half realised. Uh, and yeah, um, I didn't think, I thought they, they did, well those editors did a great job, but for that readership, for those, for their readerships. Um, and the one I did was uh, defensive, I think. I was leaving out a lot of poems that I thought would upset people. And you didn't do that, yeah. <laughs> the advantage of being from another continent. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when you're writing, it doesn't matter. I don't care about what I'm writing about. And, but then if I have to send it to a newspaper, especially, or, or, or a big magazine, I think, oh God. You know, I, Maurice Schwartz keeps asking me to send him poems about killing fish, to, fishing to the monthly, and I said, these people in Carlton read, having a coffee and a croissant, I want to read about me killing an 80 pound mulloway. <laughs> <laughs> but you never that's, know, that's you never good. know. Some people really like it. They... <laughs> Letting guts out of so. <laughs> <laughs> That's John Tranter. <laughs> he was offended, John Tranter was offended by my blood and guts. <laughs> well, I think we'll stop the conversation there, um, but uh, thank you, Bob. Great, thank you. <laughs> no, that's great. Well, Devin's, got, Devin's going to read now. Thank you.